Welcome back, everybody. We are so excited to carry on with another episode of our series today. And in this episode, we're going to discuss how can we still make the practices and processes of grading for learning possible despite so many challenges or unknowns. As you may have seen in the blog post, three ways to make the switch to grading for learning. We can refine our practices no matter what the context or constraints might be. And to help us explore this topic today, we have two outstanding practitioners and leaders joining us. We have Dr. Roberto Derisons and Dr. Heather McClure. Thank you. So I want to welcome our first guest, Dr. Roberto Derisons. How are you doing today, Roberto? Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks. Roberto is coming to us today from San Francisco, California. He is the head of school at the Millennium School, which is a lab school. Roberto has held a variety of roles in education in his career. He has served as director of curriculum and instruction, teacher and principal in London, Brazil, and even at Middlebury College in Vermont. Roberto has also not only led schools to shifts towards grading for learning practices, but he's also researched the positive impact of standards-based grading and contributed to the field as a leader of student-centered practices around the world. So welcome, Roberto. Thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about where you're joining us from today? Yeah, I'm joining you from San Francisco. Um, um, I'm the head of school at the Millennium School, a progressive lab school in the city, aimed to reimagine middle school. So it's a school that really leans into progressive practices, um, social emotional learning and uh, experiential learning in particular. I love it. There's probably a lot of reimagining that can be done for middle schools too. You've shared us a little bit about your school. What would you say maybe one thing we should know about maybe you or your family or your just general community? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. <laughs> I, um, I think I lean to, towards multiculturalism. I've been, um, my family is from Venezuela and uh, I moved to the U.S. Uh, when I was 10 uh, to South Carolina. Um, and um, I've had the privilege um, to work uh, around the world. Um, and so I consider myself a, a lover of cultures and multicultural myself. Super, I love it. So many stories I can imagine. What would you say are your current educator passions, projects, or maybe even research? Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm a bit of a geek. I'm always learning. Um, I love, I think that's what uh, makes me really passionate about being in the field of education. Um, right now, my current interests continue to be around grading, uh, grading for equity, grading for learning, um, and how schools can um, shift towards these practices. Um, the literature is filled with anecdotal reports of how difficult it is to make transitions in grading in particular in schools. So I'm pretty, I'm very focused in, in that area right now. And I'm also in um, very focused on what we call at our current school, JEDI work, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and how we can further anti-racism uh, in our educational systems. I love that acronym. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Welcome. And I get to welcome our guest, Dr. Heather McClure, who is a researcher and professor at the University of Oregon. She is also a director of Center for Equity Promotion. And Heather is particularly interested in uh, the learning and health among marginalized populations, particularly Latinx, immigrant youth, and families. I also know that she is working on applying learner-centered learner assessment practice shifts in her graduate courses. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Where are you joining us from today? I am in sunny, thank goodness, Eugene, Oregon today. Excellent. And what is one thing we should know about you, your family, or your community? Well, one thing that comes to mind um, is I'm a parent. I have a 10-year-old daughter. And one of the things that I've loved about working with you in particular, Erin, and learning from you um, about um, formative assessment and is that 
um, in my own parenting, but also in our research studies that focus on supporting um, parenting practices, but also in our family school partnership work, where we're looking at the importance of parenting practices coupled with aligned, where there's alignment across schools and homes, looking also at classroom-based behavioral practices of teachers, that the why of formative assessment ripples throughout. And so I get to reflect on not just these really critical spheres for young people of home and school, but I get to reflect on my own parenting and try things out and to see my daughter's response of feeling lit up, of feeling excited. It makes it all come home in a way that is deeply personal as well as professional. And that is really fun. That is fun. Yeah. Excellent. I love that, that personal connection. Uh, what are your current education passions, projects, or research? Oh my goodness. So I am really lucky because I get to direct a research center where the overarching glue of all of our work, and we have a number of different investigators, researchers, who are doing really diverse projects. Um, and what keeps us together is our concern for equity. So the unique needs of learners and the unique um, opportunities to increase access, the unique opportunities to promote learning and engagement and positive self-esteem and self-efficacy and all of that yummy stuff that allows young people to feel that they can pursue their passions um, and have equitable outcomes, whatever that means for those learners. Um, so we, in terms of my own research, I am really fascinated by um, psychosocial stress exposure. And the, what that really means is how our interrelationships, how our social interactions, which I think we've all become much more appreciative of during this pandemic, <laughs> how that influences our health, how it influences our ability to attend, to learn. Um, and when those interactions are stressful, ways that we can buffer ourselves so that we can still be resilient um, and still uh, make decisions that benefit our lives, even in the face of that stress, whether the stress takes the form of racism, whether the stress takes the form of um, ableism, whether it takes the form of homophobia, of transphobia, of sexism, et cetera, those are very stressful social interactions and relationships that then we can think about how do we systemically but also interpersonally disrupt those social interactions for better possibilities for for children and for adults I love that and indeed it is it is yummy and I and I love how you spoke about all those considerations because sometimes I don't know that people make the connection between those considerations and formative assessment and grading. So, you know, we're, we're talking about integrating all these things. So I'm so glad you're well, here. Well, equity is in the doing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and these are more how you can do this, how we make this concrete. And so that's why I've loved learning from you in the last few months. <laughs> well, thanks again. I'm so glad you're here. And we're gonna dive into some questions next. Lindsay, you wanna start? Sounds good. And Roberto, I'd love to hear from you just as a starting point. We know that you have not only led shifts towards grading for learning practices in schools, but you've also conducted research on the impact that such, such shifts may have on student achievement. So across both your work and research, what are some themes that may have stood out to you that distinguish scenarios where an authentic transformation did occur or with those scenarios where maybe a school really remained stuck in their journey towards change? Thank you. Um, and I just wanna note, um, Heather, the, the, that trauma-informed lens is so important. Uh, I'm so glad you're highlighting it. And it does have to do so much with grading and with um, just our general practices today, both because of the pandemic and because we're starting to realize so much um, how to better support our marginalized and BIPOC individuals in particular. So thank you for raising that. Um, you know, I think in terms of themes, 
Um, the first thing I think about is uh, schools are slow to change. You know, there's so much great research happening. Uh, one of the reasons I pursued my doctorate is because I wanted to be both in the doing and in the thinking, you know, in terms of research. And um, we know so much about grading. Grading is at best uh, subjective perceptions of reality. You know, they can be influenced by um, effort, attendance, racism, you know, um, sexism. They, um, they are not true predictors of achievement. Um, and the research has over and over um, shown us that. But as schools, because I think because we as adults have experienced them, you know, we're slower to implement those changes because we see school in our own image, you know, and parents see school in their own image. So, so systems of education are quite slow to change. Um, and I think in, in the terms of themes that I, that I think really differentiate authenticity versus just initiative building or <laughs> trying to get through a, a plan, um, one is really recognizing that fallacy. Uh, recognizing purpose, you know, why do we grade? Is it to provide formative feedback? Is it to provide a score to colleges? Is it to provide uh, information for parents? I think really understanding purpose is, is incredibly important. And really understanding the equity lens as well. You know, how do we harm or support students as part of um, grading and assessment practices in schools? Um, and the, the literature in both experience, I can tell uh, uh, in my own falling over at times through in, uh, changing practices, um, one is time. I think schools really overestimate what they can achieve in a year and underestimate what they can achieve in three to five, you know. So I think taking a measured approach to change is really important. There are incredible individuals that have done work in this area and are guiding schools. Uh, many have that have been in your program. I, um, you know, when I was in doubt, I would call Dr. Leanne Jung, who does a lot of work with grading and um, and students with learning differences or um, uh, students that who are high achievers. Um, and uh, you know, I have Ken O'Connor's book, <laughs> Grading for Learning, always accessible. You know, uh, um, John Hattie has done incredible meta-analysis work on the power of effective feedback um, and, and how that can be such a driver in increasing student learning results. So, so I think schools that really embrace the research, embrace the help, embrace the time uh, that it takes, and the parent and, and educator education in that time and, and paradigm shift is important, I think. You know, to be successful, you have to spend a great deal of time shifting paradigms. And, and that's, uh, that to me differentiates a school that's really serious about changing um, uh, practices towards improved student uh, achievement and those that are doing it for face value, you know. Um, in my own research, I um, looked at one school, so it's very, it's limited, but I looked at it over a decade of um, grading work, um, half of which was traditional and half of which was standard-based. And I compared it to results on the um, MAP and WEA assessment. And while there are so many pieces that could influence student achievement, the results yielded that uh, standard-based um, reporting. Um, so where uh, teachers are specifically um, outlining objectives and providing feedback towards those objectives are um, more correlated to student achievement as displayed in, in the MAP assessment, which is uh, measures uh, uh, learning towards standards. Um, so to, to me, what that tells me is uh, that it reinforces um, the research, which says that when we give sp kids sp specific objectives, good feedback and surround that with good practices based on mastery and um, instead of subjective scoring um, that can be demoralizing and, and damaging, um, students um, will do better, you know, we'll, we'll know the, the road towards learning in a much more clearer way. So um, that was a bit my long-winded answer to your, <laughs> to your great question. <laughs>
it's a fairly vast topic to be fair <laughs> we did throw you a very wide open question there so but thank you so much and i mean just pulling out some of those key themes we've heard a lot in these episodes around purpose for sure and that piece of being actually able to sustain the change for instance but circling back around the you know lack perhaps of research out there that may demonstrate when there are questions and when there are you know concerns by parents for instance that may also lead someone to take timid steps and so being able to contribute to that field i think is really powerful for supporting those who want to make that that brave journey so thank you dr mcclure would you like to share a response to that question well i just want to thank you roberto for <laughs> that for your response because i think of all of you i am the newest kid on this block that <laughs> And, and so I love the references. I was writing them down. Um, I, I think one, I want to circle back very quickly to Roberto. At the beginning, you spoke about a trauma-informed system of support. And one of the reasons that's so critical is because contexts for learning shape the um, willingness of students who may feel extremely vulnerable to engage and to take a chance and to take a chance on developing a relationship with a teacher and to begin to explore their own learning which is innate but for children um, who experience trauma um, it, the the opportunity to relax enough to be able to engage without hypervigilance can really be quite a gift and so um, I just wanted to point to evaluation strategies that allow children to get feedback in a way where they're never questioning whether they are at the center mm -hmm. of whatever feedback is given, that they are this, the, the most important element of this conversation or this process, as opposed to feeling that they are once again being told they're not measuring up to an external standard, can be deeply healing psychologically as well as academically um and so i just i'm so grateful to be a part of this conversation because i feel like um higher ed has a lot to learn about how to shift our assessment practices to be um reflective of and inclusive of the whole student as opposed to some external standards that somehow we are being rigorous in putting the standards or the expectations over the student. So. Thank you so much for that. And we're grateful to have you here with us. I would say you're not the new kid on the block at all, but we're <laughs> grateful to, to be bringing in that lens from the post-secondary world too, most certainly. And it's heartening to me to hear that people are opening their eyes to it, most certainly. So thank you for that. Roberto, did you want to say something? No, I just, uh, it made me think also of, um, I, I loved Heather, how you framed it as centering the student. I think often we don't uh, use that frame enough. Um, and um, when talking about educational change, you know, and practices, and I think, you know, we often equate um, grading for learning or changes towards standards-based grading as this huge endeavor which it is you know you, you have to comprehend the that huge paradigm shift but there are small practices that are so impactful on a day-to-day -day. for example self-assessment you know we don't um we don't consider enough self-assessment but we know from research that when students self-assess their own progress towards mastery um, they are, uh, their understanding of the gap between where they are at and mastery is um, more clearly um, internalized and articulated. And when that's matched in a conversation with an educator around what they perceive to be mastery, that conferring is incredibly powerful in that learning growth. Um, and that it's a tool that can be applied on, a, on an assessment by, you know, saying, all right, you grade yourself first before I grade you, or I'm going to give you this report card, you know, on the left, why don't you, you know, give yourself a, a narrative and a, a mastery score, and then I'll do it after you. You know, just that centering has an incredible uh, power, but it's a huge paradigm shift, you know, uh, probably when you ask most parents, you know, even in my own experience of parent-teacher conferences, they always want to jump to the I just want to talk directly to the teacher, but really the conversation 
needs to center the student and probably be led by the student, you know, uh, in most instances. So I, I appreciated that, um, that emphasis. Mm -hmm. Like how we're talking about um, putting that power back in the hands of our learners. And it's in a structured, supportive way um, to build that self-efficacy, self-determination so that they are not only ready academically, but, but ready as as humans as well. So this next question, um, it kind of links some things we've been talking about together, these practices that can lead us to um, student-centered, human-centered assessment practices, grading practices, grading for learning. Um, and these are, you know, we have wonderful reasons why we do these things and try these things, but it can get messy. We're, we are talking about paradigm shifts. <laughs> um, so, um, Heather, I'm going to start with you because I know you're um, trying out some things in your graduate courses. Um, so, um, and I happen to know, you know, you're, you're asking students you know, to inform things that perhaps before you had planned and had ready to go. And so sometimes um, inviting that participation, it, it it gets messy because you don't always know what, what the response is going to be. So I don't know if you want to share a little bit what you're trying and what inspires or fuels you to persist even when it, it, it might feel messy. <laughs> well, you know full well how messy it has gotten. <laughs> you were my advisor in rethinking when I sent you my syllabus before teaching this graduate level course that I'm just finishing up this term called Leading for Equity. And this is a course that is really a survey course of different equity frameworks and approaches and um, boy, assessment has really been writ large for a number of reasons um, that I'll, I'll get to. But your feedback, Erin, I was really intimidated by the shifts that it felt after um, reading your dissertation, after becoming aware of how I felt like my fundamental assessment approaches were actually not aligned with what I was teaching which felt very um, imposed. The assessment strategies felt very like, well, now I will assert my authority as the professor. The, grad, the students in this class are doctoral students. As you know, they're doctoral students, they're master's students. Many of them are also administrative licensure students who are professionals working full-time in the schools who are coming back to get training in order to be building leaders and district leaders. These are a phenomenal group of human beings, many of whom are equity leaders in their, in their domains. And so um, the, the, no, the, my awareness of the need for infusing equity into assessment strategies, honestly, is due to being um, in conversations with administrative licensure students in the summer and the fall as we were rethinking as educators, how do we best engage students during comprehensive distance learning, during CDL? And one of the, in, the, the clear realizations is that typical approaches of taking attendance and having attendance be an important part of the evaluation of a student was not cutting it because the socioeconomic inequalities the reality is that the older the student got, the more likely they actually weren't attending class because a parent had lost a job and they were, they were a breadwinner in the family now. To say nothing of the digital divide, to say nothing of students who have tough home lives being very reluctant to log on because they don't want anybody seeing their homes. These are realities in COVID, and this is just to scratch the surface. And so all of a sudden, using attendance as a, an indicator of student engagement fell apart completely, not completely, but importantly. Um, and so to hear students in my admin licensure classes talking about this really made me rethink what does it mean in a genuinely, in a, uh, Roberto, earlier you spoke about um, authentic, authentic engagement. And that is so important because when we talk about um, equity work as being deeply rooted in the local reality, the local context, the local histories, the assets, cultural and otherwise of that place, as well as the local challenges, um, 
one of the things we talk about all the time is that what, what is it that we can generalize in how we think about equity? And one of those is, is in the values that drive the behaviors that then drive the accountability um, or that drive the, the actions and the monitoring and assessment is a core part of that. And the values that I hear coming up over and over again with the teachers who are continuing to just pull rabbits out of a hat during <laughs> comprehensive distance learning. I mean, the, the extent to which these teachers will go riding their bicycles around town to drop off copies, paper copies of math homework because they know students are having trouble logging on. I can't tell you how much exercise these teachers are getting <laughs> and in Oregon that involves biking through the rain. I mean, I am so blown away by what teachers have done to connect with students. But the values underlying a lot of that have, have been quite clarified, I think, in this time. And those values that I have heard across the board are humility and accountability on the part of teachers because of being so challenged by addressing students' needs in order to support ongoing learning at a time when the barriers feel insurmountable sometimes. So all of that is as a backdrop mm -hmm. to your question, Erin, which is what I did in class. And what I did is I tried from the very beginning to engage students in a way I hadn't around how we build our community. And so I, I began with a social contract. And that was per your advice when I said, oh goodness, where do I begin? And you said, well, here's some ideas. So the thing that was really astounding about the social contract is that we focused on the values we wanted to undergird our community and how we related with each other, and then moved on to some rules. What are the rules that for us feel important as kind of guardrails on this freeway, on this expressway? Um, and then what were our expectations? And the students, now granted these are extraordinarily knowledgeable and skilled students, so I have, which is why I love learning from them and working with them. Um, the values they laid out with the, the rules and the expectations were so core to the themes of the class that we, it, I almost felt like at the end of the social contract exercise saying, all right, that's done, that's a wrap, have a great rest of your term, everybody, you nailed it. You know, and then of course the question became, what does this look like in practice? Because it always comes down to what does this look like in practice? The messy part, so that was thrilling. That was completely amazing. I was like, yes, all right. The messy part was that they, in all of their brilliance, brought up all of these questions that were catalyzed by the conversations that they had in their small groups as part of our coming to a, a kind of collective understanding. Um, I dare say consensus because it's really hard for me, I didn't take a vote, I didn't, and online, it's a little hard to get a feel for where people are, but I think there was a fairly strong consensus on much of it, but there was a lot of discussion about engagement and a lot of awareness of what does an anti-racist approach to engagement mean in terms of, of conversation? And there were questions like, should we have a system where we encourage all of the students of color to speak first? So they have the option to speak or to pass. What does that feel like? What does confidenti confidentiality feel like in terms of what we can or what do we need permission for? What should group members feel free to bring into the larger group conversation? Do we need explicit permission, which was what we landed on? Um, and the students corrected each other when someone was sharing someone else's story without permission. So that was some neat practice. But the messy part was where, um, because of the nature of Oregon, where there are a number of teachers in rural areas, and there may be one uh, art teacher who works for the entire district, and the moment you mention that somebody is the art teacher and they know where they live, they know the district that they are the art teacher for. So therefore, the need also to protect, pr protect personally identifying information became really important for purposes of confidentiality. So in terms of um, student engagement and setting the context for students feeling really um, supported, and I wouldn't say empowered or emboldened because that kind of implies that 
A, I can bestow that, and B, they need that invitation. Um, they were perfectly willing and capable to do that. But we wrestled for a long time with this question of confidentiality and with the question of how do we create structure around our conversations to ensure that people who may feel, um, maybe who may be less likely to, um, to participate will. For me, that simply alerted me to a number of white students saying, I'm shy, I don't feel comfortable speaking up. And so that became more a general approach. I typically try to engage students who I feel are not, um, don't may not feel as comfortable or as confident engaging, but it was definitely a reminder to me of good pedagogical practice, but it had this very important um, equity consideration. And I will be honest with you, we never fully landed on how we would structure our conversations, but it did raise an awareness. And we then had a shared language to kind of muddle through it together as a class. And I felt that we just had our bunny ears pricked in a way that I think was really helpful for how we spoke with one another. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, there's so many amazing parts of your answer. The fact that, um, you know, too often I hear, oh, higher ed, you know, is off the hook or can't do these things because it's a whole different system. <laughs> it's still learning and we can, we can make these shifts there too. And why not? Um, so I love that you're walking the walk and then with the concrete example, like a social contract of what that can look like and how it can become a living, breathing things that, that help navigate the learning as you go um, is, I think, a, a great example of how um, we can put these things into motion, no matter what the age and stage of the learners might be, and, it, and to, to for authentic learning, which I think, no matter how old one is, prefer <laughs> authentic <laughs> learning. Um, Roberto, what inspires you to persist when, when things get messy? Yeah, um, thank you, um, and and thank you, uh, Heather, for the um, you know the emphasis on building the container. I think you know if any if anything, this pandemic is teaching us is how important it is to focus, especially in that initial part of creating relationships with students. Um, it is to build that safe container, um, and that it takes. Uh, collaborative work, not hierarchical work. Yeah, you know? um, so I appreciate that. You know, what drives me uh, in this work is really around creating more student agency around their learning. You know, I um, I think that uh, we are in a system of education that really hasn't changed much in the last hundred years. Students go from one box to the other, one level to the next check off marks the good the students who really know how to do school do well um, and we really have not re-examined in a macro sense our practices um, in ways that i think merit attention um, so for me i think of um, really student agency um, student engagement um, and student achievement in the end um, and how we can foster those pieces um, it, for me, the focus uh, on an academic level has been around grading uh, and, and reporting, but there's so many other elements from the container building to the, um, the physical layout of a school to teacher well-being. I think we often talk about student well-being, but if a teacher is not well, then they can't be well for their students. So um, I think, you know, that's a whole different conversation area where I think merits so much attention in, in the ways that we can foster greater well-being on, on the teacher level. Um, but really it's that core part, is that student agency, uh, student engagement, student ownership of their own learning that, that is driving me and that I hope the pandemic is teaching us um, to refocus on, you know, um, I think, you know, I loved Heather's example of attendance. You know, we're an attendance driven, but really at the end is, are you providing evidence of learning and, you know, towards an objective? I mean, you can do that by attending class sometimes in a, in a hopeful world, but you can also do that asynchronously. You can do that um, in so many different avenues. And I think that 
the pandemic is also um, highlighting that we should be a little bit more open to some of those other avenues. Um, and then I laugh a little bit because <laughs> Heather, your example of the teachers uh, uh, going around in, in bicycles reminds me of uh, my teacher who in sixth grade, we generally do a frog dissection. Um, who delivered frogs to be dissected to family <laughs> at, at one point during our virtual learning. Um, you know, so it's like true dedication this year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I can imagine frogs on bikes in <laughs> That's awesome. That is dedication. Um, I think I get to ask the next question as well, because um, our time is, is flying by, which, <laughs> because these, these are just rich examples, and, and I, I love it. So I'm going to jump to, um, and Heather, I'll, I'll go back to you for this question. Um, what words of encouragement would you offer directly to um, teachers, principals, or professors out there um, who are either beginning this journey or considering a shift, or who are already on the path and could use some encouragement. Um, what are your words of encouragement? Well, I think the first words of encouragement I would have are um, yours, Erin, to me, which is to start small, which is to take bite-sized pieces, start small, um, don't overwhelm yourself to just put a toe in the water and then build on that success sequentially. Um, so that's that was very helpful. Um, I think the second word of encouragement is to really trust your students. And, and I say that in regards to assessment because um, I have a peer appraisal, peer feedback as a really important part of some of the assignments. Um, and Roberto, when you use the word container, um, that it brought to mind that an understanding of students' relationships with one another is really important for peer work to work well. And so that structure, that safe container around how students will work together. So in our case, um, we had students provide constructive feedback on one another's peer reflections, which could be quite personal about an equity challenge and what you've learned and um, how that's informed your um, engagement in school and st with students and what, what you might do, have done differently. Um, and it's quite a sensitive topic. It's a crucial topic, that self-reflection piece. But it was really important to know uh, and to give students an option to choose who they wanted or who they would prefer not to respond to their work. And so I think having, I think the word of encouragement would be trust your students and know, your students will know best um, who they can engage with um, in a way that can be productive for them. That said, there is an emerging body of evidence around cooperative learning that actually it can be, when well done, an extraordinarily effective anti-racist form of pedagogy um, because it breaks down the racial and ethnic segregation that can happen in schools through having collective goals and through encouraging collaboration. And there is more and more evidence around that. And Mark Van Ryzen, who is a researcher at the University of Oregon, has really been doing some extraordinary work around cooperative learning here in Oregon schools. Um, but I do think that um, the assessment approaches work best when there is a moment of appraisal and there is kind of setting everyone up for success by um, to the best of our ability I mean we can't know everything and the messiness comes in realizing the things we wish we'd known back then yeah. um, so I think those would be my two my That's two cool. things that come to mind and I love how your examples and your words of encouragement link um, grading for learning back to all the things that that need to come before I've been in situations where Grading was very separate, or thought of as separate or on top of all those other learning processes. And in order to successfully grade for learning, um, those components you just spoke about, Heather, have to be there. Otherwise, it could be grading for something else <laughs> instead of grading for learning. Roberto, what words of encouragement do you have? I would echo the start small, you know, um, the whether it's 
you know, including self-assessment as part of the structure, moving towards, you know, uh, giving mastery rubric scores uh, against objectives instead of just a comprehensive grade, um, or even as small as thinking of how you administer an assessment. You know, like uh, we know from research, for example, if you highlight minority students in some fashion before taking an assessment that they will do worse on that assessment and won't show their true capability. Um, you know, they're, they're, I guess my, my ultimate word of encouragement is that so much rich uh, expertise and research out there um, that starting small um, can um, then lead to big outcomes. Um, you know, I, um, there's a Facebook group on standards-based grading and that I'm always amazed at what the educators produce on that group. And there's always nuggets that I'm like, oh, you know, wonderful. I'm gonna do this tomorrow or share this with this team or that team. So I think um, uh, starting small and, and using the expertise around you, uh, whether it's reading, whether it's partnering with higher ed, there's, I'm, you know, over the last five to 10 years, dissertation wise, there's so much great pieces there around grading, around um, assessment practice that um, can really inform our schools. So um, I think it, kind of leaning towards those pieces um, it, in finding a partner, you know, <laughs> things can be lonely, but if you find a partner um, that like you, Heather and Aaron did together, um, finding a partner, maybe it's another teacher, maybe it's another administrator to go through the process together um, of that desired change, but being uh, specific and purposeful about what's the change that we're trying to make uh, would be my words of encouragement. And, and I think, in the end, you'd be surprised. Some of these practices will also have increased benefits on the educational educator level, not just on the student level. So um, it can bring a level of clarity and well-being that um, not engaging in these can, um, you know, not reap the benefits of. <laughs> but that makes sense. <laughs> Well, I think that links back to what you were talking about earlier. We got to take care of our all of our humans, including our educators, and that um, partnering with somebody, taking one thing at a time, um, investing in this work can ultimately bring people relief, uh, the educator people in this process too. Um, I'm thinking back to how I like how I used to grade um, t papers as an English teacher, and it was completely overwhelming to. Uh, you know, several years later, as I practice and refine, um, putting, you know, getting the students involved more often and being able to successfully self-assess so that we did the work together rather than all on, all on my shoulders. That's an incredible point. Thank you very much. Lindsay, over to you. Yep, absolutely. And so many rich points shared in there too. So thank you for that. I know our audience values the insights and expertise that you bring. And just to amplify those voices that Again, it is not a journey to take alone. Whether you are a school leader, whether you are a teacher, whether you are someone at any level in the school um, building desiring to practice this piece, there are a lot of resources and a lot of individuals out there that want to collaborate around this. So just to support all of that piece, thank you so much. We are disappointed to say that we're coming so much. Oh my gosh. However, however, we have our favorite question to conclude these with really, <laughs> and that is, what did we not ask that you wish we had? And Roberto, I'll give that first opportunity to you. And it could also be, as opposed to framing it as a question, just something that you felt you wanted to end with, so. Um, I think uh, this, a, it was a hard question. I, um, I, uh, because we explored so many topics um, that now I'm thinking of, of Heather's research and um, so many areas that I would want to explore with her um, <laughs> around trauma-informed practices. Um, Bring it on, we, Roberto. <laughs> um, I think, you know, uh, another, a bigger topic to explore is change management. Um, how do you manage big change initiatives, especially if you're leading a school? I think we, 
it, it, rightly so, we, we concentrated the, edu the conversation on educators and their, you know, their, their classes, the, the students in front of them. Um, but a lot of this work is taking place in districts, in s big schools. And so how do you manage um, big change initiatives that require paradigm shifts? Um, but that could be a whole episode in itself, Lindsay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I would agree. And I hope there's a lot of takeaways from the various insights shared in these episodes that could help guide administrators or school leaders of any level, because you're absolutely right. And having been in the field, I can attest that change management is, it can be an obstacle. Um, so thank you for that. And Heather, last opportunity here. Is there a question we didn't ask that you wish we had or a particular theme you wanted to touch on that wasn't necessarily brought up today? Well, there was so much rich that was brought up. And for the sake of time, I think I would just touch on one thing, which is that um, grading for learning can also be deeply culturally responsive. And so our work with um, families and communities, for instance, we have a project that we hope to launch with Pacific Islander families. And there is a huge element there of students often not attending because they're in church. So for um, families who, uh, for whom faith is extremely important, which is very common in, in the diverse Pacific Islander communities here in the Pacific Northwest, um, attending church with family is really important. And so in that, in that project, we're bringing in faith leaders because they know the families, they know the students, and it's not that they don't want to be in school, it's that they do want to be um, attending very important cultural and community events in their faith organizations, in their, in their churches. And so, and I also think of our work with Native American communities, where often um, tribal events don't align neatly with curricular, with, with school calendars. And so the whole idea of chronic attendance as an indication of I get why that is such a crucial indicator in our schools but I think that just as we can kind of ask more of the why it's not that students aren't wanting to be here it's that they're wanting to be more somewhere else <laughs> and that that's crucial for purposes of community strengths and cultural assets and the resilience of students and families and to say nothing of cultural continuity I mean those are all really important and I think that often when assessment practices are kind of opened up and they're reflected upon, that there are also ways to integrate um, approaches of communities into those assessment practices um, that can also integrate students who may not actually be in school at that moment. Nevertheless, there are important ways they can engage and there are ways to re-involve and reintegrate students who may have been out for a bit um, for whatever reason. Um, but I think that opening up questions of assessment and, a, and the question of assessment for what and for whom inherently raises questions of how do we bring the home assets and community assets to play in ways that are really honoring of the students in the classroom and actually can be really important learning opportunities for everybody. Um, and it involves um, an honoring of parents' engagement with their students' lives in ways that may not be self-evident in traditional grading approaches. So that's the last thing I would well, say. Well ended, I must say. But just to take your line, your quote there, if you will, from assessment for what and for whom. Start with purpose. And similarly with grading for what and for whom. If we can begin somewhere, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for a starting point, and it ties right back to so many things that you just said around culturally responsive practice too. So thank you so much for concluding our discussion together thank today. Uh, and thank you, Lindsay, Aaron, and Heather. It was so much fun to to stop in the in the middle of the day and and talk about such important topics. Uh, so I enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for the amazing work that all of you are doing in leading this. It's so important. Thank you. Likewise.
amazing to um, have the opportunity to connect with people and see like we aren't in this alone and and there are people who um, are, are jump they have already jumped in are jumping in and we can um, talk to each other and gain inspiration and support from each other so we hope that our listeners and our viewers out there have enjoyed all of the rich discussions that we've had the opportunity to share with these amazing practitioners and leaders in this field of grading for learning. And we recommend that you uh, dig in, dig into the process, dig into the experience, dig into the resources that have been shared across a variety of these different episodes. And certainly recognize again that it is not a journey to walk alone. There are so many people out there ready and willing to support your learning experience through this through this entire process so we thank you all and hope you have a great day